Today we are going to cover Lovecraft Country, a show starring Journey Smollett. Don't get her confused with her French brother that no one seems to like. The episode starts with Letty sitting in a church while people around her sing and dance. A single tear drops from her eye while watching the people around her. It's 1955, Letty shows her sister Ruby a house that she recently bought. The property is located on the north side of Chicago. This location is known to be a predominantly white neighborhood. Ruby asks Letty how she could possibly afford to buy that property because she a broke ass. Letty ignores the question, but as soon as Ruby enters, she said, well, no wonder it was affordable. According to Letty, the property has three floors and 13 rooms. Letty then tells Ruby about her plan to turn the property into a boarding house. This house will act as a safe haven for black people. Ruby says she doesn't have time for this tomfoolery because she plans on applying to Marshall Fields, a retail store in a predominantly white area. Ruby reluctantly agrees to move in with Letty and help her fix the house up. Before she agreed, she said she'll take the largest room in the house because she's the size of Medea. Letty then shows Ruby the in-house elevator. However, when she calls for it, there is no response. When Letty sticks her head into the shaft, the elevator slams down. Fortunately, Ruby manages to pull Letty out in time. Letty tries to laugh it off while Ruby says it's not funny. Yeah, ain't nobody in their right mind want to use that now. Elsewhere, Hippolyta puts on her makeup and gets ready. Diana then tells her Tick is done making breakfast. Hippolyta takes George's favorite book, Dracula, from the drawer and starts tearing the pages out. Downstairs, Diana and Tick prepare breakfast. Diana pauses as she almost sets a place at the table for her deceased father. Tick asks her if she's okay, and she answers that everything is fine. Hippolyta joins in, and they start eating breakfast together. Atticus tells her she laid on them bills. She gotta pay them auto mo bills. Diana tells everyone that she wants to check out the scrapyard for robot parts later. Atticus, however, says he's not staying over because he has things to take care of. Atticus then arrives at Montrose's place. He finds Montrose, his father, drunk on the floor. Atticus is like, wake up, motherfucker, and tosses water in his face. Atticus starts talking to Montrose about how George has died. He proposes to at least tell Hippolyta the truth, but Montrose angrily refuses. The two get into a heated argument, and Atticus decides to walk out. The next day, Letty begins accepting tenants into her new home. She takes pictures of the people in the house as she passes through. Someone tries to be friendly to Ruby, but she like, bye Felicia. Soon after, Atticus arrives to say his goodbyes. Diana and Hippolyta seem to be doing better, so he thinks it might be time for him to return to Florida. Letty says she has a free room, and Tick can stay there for a few days. Tick tells her he can't. While Letty is hugging Tick, she hears cars honking outside. As they head out, they see three white men in their vehicles. These the Tamu versions of James Dean. They look like frozen Jimmy Dean sausages. Police officers pass by and act as if nothing is wrong. In fact, they ass is smiling as if they proud. Atticus then decides to stick around a little longer. Three days later, Letty sleeps while a ghost pulls the cover off her. The ghost appears as an elderly woman watching Letty sleep. The woman then yanks the blanket off Letty, waking her up. Damn, that old lady just wanted to pound her. Letty gets up, opens the windows, and hears the car horns outside the house. The white people's harassment apparently has been going on for a couple of days now. Letty then heads to the basement to check out the boiler. As she fixes it, she hears a loud bang. The sound seems to come from further within the basement. The banging sound continues while Letty follows it to its source. After tracing it to a cellar door, Letty runs in terror when she hears several voices whispering to her. Later, Letty returns with Atticus to the cellar. Tick goes into the basement with a baseball bat in his hand and doesn't find anything. Damn, man's all oiled up with big muscles. Letty insists that something was trying to get out of there. Atticus tells her it might be stress. He then says that it is understandable, considering what they have been through. Letty thinks it was their white neighbors who messed with the boiler. Because of this, Tick offers to nail the basement windows down. I bet that's not the only thing Letty wants him to nail down. Letty thanks him while holding his hand. He takes his hand back because he married to Megan Good. A couple of days later, Letty hosts a housewarming party. Ruby sings in the living room while everyone is drinking and dancing. You know damn well those white people jealous right now because they was not invited to the cookout. Letty goes to the kitchen and thanks Hippolyta for bringing so much food. Hippolyta says she had lots of leftovers, so it's actually Letty doing her a favor to prevent Hippolyta from looking like a hippo. Hippolyta then starts talking about Atticus. This makes Letty think that Tick reminds Hippolyta of George. Hippolyta denies this and asks Letty if she saw Diana and her friends. In the attic, Diana and her friends play with an Ouija board. When Bobo, one of Diana's friends, asks if he's going to have fun on his trip to the south, the lights flicker. The board answers no to his question. Hell no, nah, don't be doing this white people shit. 
They then follow up by asking who they are talking to. The board then spells out George's name. Thinking it's a prank, Diana shoves the board aside and walks out. Her friends, however, insist that the planchette moved on its own. Hippolyta calls out for Diana but gets no response. Whispering voices then catch her attention. She checks out the source of the whispers and is led to a room. On a table in the room, she finds a gold mechanical model of the solar system. Atticus enters the house dressed in his military uniform. As it turns out, he was standing guard on the porch. His friend Tree approaches him and asks him about his relationship with Letty. Tree said he used to give Letty chiropractic adjustments before, and he feeling nostalgic tonight. Letty then catches Atticus staring at her while dancing. Letty goes to the bathroom and sees a vision of a bloody George in the mirror. She ignores it and turns for the door. There she sees Atticus standing. Atticus kisses Letty, and the two get intimate on the bathroom countertop. After a while, Atticus notices that Letty is bleeding. Letty explains that her cycle just started and apologizes. Atticus says it's not a big deal as he leaves. He probably prefers it a little bloody anyway. After a while, Ruby brags about how she's going to apply to that retail store she always yapping about. She says if more black folks were like her, their race would be further along. Oh, she thinking she better than everyone else. She opens a window and sees a large cross set on fire in the front yard. Tick tells James to get the shotgun and heads out. As Letty leaves the house, she grabs a baseball bat. Letty starts breaking the windows of the cars in front of the house. She removes the bricks tied to the steering wheels to stop the vehicles from honking. This scene cathartic because I just know everyone been wanting the pale people to get their comeuppance. Expecting the police to arrive soon, the group puts the shotguns in the back of Ruby's car and she drives away. A few moments later, they all put their hands behind their heads as the police officers come. In a patrol car, Captain Lancaster starts asking Letty questions. He reads Letty's records and mocks her saying she's a monkey. Boy, I just know this police officer's wife is disappointed in the bedroom. Letty asks him if he received any of her 21 complaints. Lancaster, however, claims that they didn't receive any complaints. The captain asks if something strange happened in Letty's new house. He also asks if someone told her to buy the Winthrop house. Letty refuses to answer, prompting Lancaster to tell his men to swerve the car. As the car swerves, Letty bounces around the inner walls. He says he knows she can't afford a house like that. This guy is as useless as a white crayon. Lancaster reveals to Letty that they found body parts of eight black people buried in the house's basement. He says she won't last long in that house. The next day, Letty goes into the basement. She now uses the cellar as a dark room for her pictures. She starts to notice a pattern in the photos that she took. As she puts the photos together on the floor, a ghostly face of a man appears. The face then emerges and tells Letty to get out of his house. Letty stands up after getting knocked back and quickly runs upstairs. He is bald as my ball sack. Moments later, Letty starts gathering the pictures from the frames hung around the house. Ruby approaches her and tells her their tenants are leaving. Letty answers that it will be safer for them to go. Ruby reminds Letty that they have an installment contract that they can't afford. Letty accidentally reveals that she still has some of their mother's inheritance money. It appears that Letty has been keeping this secret from Ruby. Letty tells Ruby that she used the inheritance money to buy the house. She explains that she didn't tell Ruby because she didn't want to upset her. Ruby, however, tells her that she is selfish. She says Letty should have split the money with her and their brother Marvin. Ruby can't believe she was always sending Letty money in the past. She always thought Letty was a fuck up, but realizes now that she just fucked up. Meanwhile, Montrose pays Hippolyta a visit. While helping Hippolyta with the groceries, Montrose stumbles and a book falls out of one of the bags. Montrose notes that the book was George's favorite. Hippolyta claims that she spilled coffee on George's copy of the book. Nah, she lying. She ripped them pages apart. They talk about George's death. Although she saw her husband's body herself, Hippolyta is not convinced that Montrose and Tick told her everything. Montrose tells her that nothing else happened, but Hippolyta still has her doubts. The next day, Atticus finds Letty at a bar. Tick asks what's going on, and Letty tells him that her house is haunted. She explains that the realtor didn't tell her much about the property. The realtor only told Letty that the house was called the Winthrop House. Letty tells Tick what she found out after digging around. The last owner of the house was a man named Hiram Epstein. Oh snap, betcha he was related to Jeffrey Epstein. Epstein was a scientist at the University of Chicago. However, he was fired for his unethical experimental practices. Letty believes Epstein was experimenting on humans. According to the cop from last night, Lancaster, eight bodies were found in her basement. Letty found out that Lancaster and Epstein knew each other. She shows Tick a print from the local paper from 1984 showing Lancaster and Epstein together. This is giving me the same vibes as Trump and Epstein's picture. Apparently, Lancaster was the lead detective in several missing person cases back then. Letty concludes that Lancaster was supplying Epstein with test subjects. 
She shows Tick the pictures she took around the house. As it turns out, the people from the photos are the eight dead victims of Epstein. Letty says the victim's souls are trapped in her house with their killer. Atticus fears that the ghost won't stop until Letty is dead. Because of this, he suggests that Letty should move out of the property. Letty talks about what happened between her and Tick on the night of the housewarming party. She reveals it was her first time. After realizing what Letty means, Tick apologizes. Letty says she doesn't regret what happened, and she actually needed it. Oh, Jonathan Majors got that good dick. She then says she needed it to feel something. Oh, I bet she did. Letty tells Tick that she feels like a ghost in her own right. Afterward, Tick and Letty hire a priestess to rid the house of the ghosts. At the front door, the priestess slices a goat's throat and marks their foreheads with its blood for protection. The group proceeds to the cellar where the presence of the ghost is. They form a circle while grabbing each other's hands. The priestess warns Tick and Letty to not let go, no matter what. While the priestess begins chanting, the lights start to flicker. Upstairs, three white men break the windows and enter the house. Armed with baseball bats, they go from room to room to look for people. Thinking they found someone, two of them barge into a room. The door shuts, and the two see a ghost dressed as a basketball player with a head of a baby. They then die as they get corned into the heater. The other intruder checks out the elevator shaft and suddenly gets decapitated. Not like he was using much of his brain anyway. Back in the cellar, the room starts shaking as the priestess chants. As the shaking intensifies, she asks Tick and Letty to chant with her. The shaking stops and the group lets out a sigh of relief. Suddenly, the water pipes burst from above them and their seals of protection are erased. The group starts to exit the cellar, but the priestess gets attacked. The priestess is possessed by the ghost of Hiram Epstein. Tick runs to help and Epstein chokes him against the wall. Letty starts calling out the names of the eight victims. The priestess's body drops as Epstein's spirit takes over Tick. He turns his attention to Letty and tells her to get out of his house. Letty pleads with the eight ghosts to help her get rid of Epstein. Epstein's victims start gathering around and help Letty finish the chant. Epstein's face start to wither away, just like how white people be aging. As they end the chant, Epstein is banished for good. A few days later, a reporter talks to Letty about her boarding house. She compliments Letty on opening up her house to the less fortunate. As the reporter leaves, she asks Letty if she knows anything about her missing white neighbors. Letty claims she doesn't know about any missing people. In actuality, the bodies of the intruders are in the tunnels beneath the property. Elsewhere, Atticus stakes out the realtor who sold Letty, the Winthrop house. Christina then arrives in a silver sedan. As it turns out, Christina paid the realtor to sell the Winthrop house to Letty. The realtor leaves as Atticus enters the room. Atticus states that Letty's inheritance didn't come from her mother. He figured out that Christina was behind it all along. Tick explains that he saw the name Winthrop carved into one of Christina's father's paintings. Christina explains who Horatio Winthrop was and how he was connected to Epstein. Tick tells her that he isn't interested in her history lesson and pulls out a gun. He tells Christina to stay away from his family. However, Christina uses her magic to immobilize Tick. She tells Atticus that her father was invulnerable before, but the magic was removed and Atticus had ended up killing her father indirectly when they tried to open the Garden of Eden. After Christina finishes, she slips her card into Tick's pocket. She tells Tick to call her when he's ready to talk more about her family's legacy. Before she leaves, she tells Tick that he should know better than to shoot a white woman. Tick stands immobilized as Christina leaves and the episode ends. That's the end of the third episode. What did you guys think? Should we cover more? Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.